All right. Does anybody remember on our last episode of History, Heresy, and Harmony, what we talked about? Pietism. Pietism. Uh, I would have preferred that we talked about cacatism, but what is pietism? Kathy Cannon will read from her notes. She takes good ones. We, what we talked about was the fact that this sort of, not even though this is on the screen here, this, you know, the snapshot from the video last week that we used, sometimes referred to as Lutheran pietism, but actually was sort of, it grew out of Lutheran circles, but it was contrary to a lot of what Luther said. It was about bringing, uh, primarily bringing emotionalism into theology and also to the expression of, um, of personal Christian walk, I guess would be the best way to describe it. So piety coming from the idea of goodness, good deeds, good works. It's, you know, it's this tension that exists between um, uh, faith and faith and works uh, and, you know, how you view salvation falling. So we talked about the reason for going through this is it sets up leading into what we're going to be talking about today, which we're, we're going to get to John Wesley and the founding of Methodism. But we're going to see that there's a there's a link back into Wesley's life that comes back from this uh, history of pietism that had been around for about a hundred well, about a hundred years before Wesley is born. And if you remember, just talking briefly, you know, there's the whole question about head versus heart. The emphasis on the confession, so not so much about the statements of faith, but about the things that relate to understanding and feeling, the rise of small groups, personal Bible study. Remember, we talked a little bit about just how important the evolution of Gutenberg's printing process was to make the Bible actually available. Of course, we all knew that because we went out and toured the museum there at HBU and saw some of that stuff. And then we talked, I think we sort of closed up talking about what a hermeneutic is and the element of feelings that are coming into hermeneutics. Remember, hermeneutic is how you read and interpret scripture. And so the element of pietism on this, and we're going to see how that it, it relates back uh, as we start here learning about John Wesley and about what was going on inside of uh, the movement that became Methodism that grew out of his life and others' life. So if I say John Wesley before we start doing anything today, what pops into anybody's head? Does anybody have any notions about Wesley before we even get there? He had a lot of kids. He had a lot of kids. He, he, was, one of, he was one of a lot of kids. <laughs> We're going to see that in the video as well. He was nine. Uh, he was nine of 13, I think. Nine of 16. Uh, one of those numbers. Um, so it was a big family. He came from a big family and then had a big family. What else? We mainly know John, but there's another sort of very famous Wesley as well. You might know his name. Is it Charles? Charles, that's his younger brother. <laughs> and a lot of the hymns that we have uh, come from, are influenced by Charles Wesley. He was quite the writer of hymns. So uh, there was a musical element to the family, which is also very important. Anything else? And it's okay if you don't, because that's the whole reason that we're here today. So uh, once again, I'm going to uh, to cheat and let uh, Dr. Ryan Reeves from Gordon Cornwell do a lot of the sort of the teaching today, because particularly these videos on Wesley, Whitfield, and we're going to slide into, we won't get there today, but the first great awakening. This is all connected stuff, and particularly the great awakening, the first one in, uh, in colonial America is very important because, because it sets the foundation for a lot of what happens denominationally in the United States moving forward from that point and the influence just on that, on the Protestant movement in general. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably only get through the Wesley and Whitfield things with our pauses and discussions today, but that's gonna lead us up to a quick look at uh, Jonathan Edwards. You've probably heard that name before, probably best known for one of the most famous sermons of all time, which is, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, uh, but then we're also going to see how that translates into the First Great Awakening, 
And there's actually been a series of awakenings. We'll talk about that over the next couple of weeks as well, uh, about just the series of how these uh, these movements pulsed through American culture, American religion, and through American society over various points of time. And the first one of these is closely associated with Wesley, which is why it ties back to that. Before we get started, of course, this is what we've been using all the way through, which is looking at the various dates. This is where we finally find ourselves today, which is the, we're going to get to the 1738 break off here, which again is a departure from the Anglican church, which leads to the sort of the Methodist flow of the chart here. We'll see why that date in 1738 is so critical today. That date relates back to something that happens in Wesley's life and the influence that there is there on Methodism. But if you notice, as we go through that, a lot of things flow out of that. The Methodist church traditionally that we think, think about, but other holiness churches, we'll talk about what we mean by that term, holiness churches. And then eventually that transitions into uh, Pentecostal and charismatic movements, particularly in the early part of the 20th century. So this is an important branch that we'll be that we'll be heading down here. We've been down most of the other branches so far. So this is an important one. And again, we will see the interplay. Don't assume just because this, you know, the way this chart is organized, that this dotted red line is a, is a divide that you can't get over. There's a lot of interchange and exchange, obviously, that happens back and forth between the top and the bottom of the graph. Any questions about that before I queue up the video? All right, I'll ask you guys to give me a thumbs up or a quick, yeah, I can hear it once we get it rolling. And uh, make it full screen. Here we go. And here we go. In this lecture, we're looking at John Wesley and the rise of the Methodist movement within the new evangelicalism of the 18th century. John Wesley is a man that is both widely known and yet often misunderstood. It's not that we don't know much about him. It's that at times, those who claim his name as part of their theological or denominational heritage, or even those from without who might have trouble with some of his doctrines, don't spend enough time understanding the context, the way he flows out of the 17th century into the 18th century, and the ways that the theological ideas of dissent coming from the reign of Charles II and beyond, really shapes Wesley's understanding of the Christian life and of salvation. John Wesley, though, and his brother Charles, as well as George Whitfield, are three of the most important men to really shape the Christian voice and the grammar during the entirety of the 18th century. And given that this is the revolutionary era and that there are so many decisions being made, both culturally, politically, and socially, particularly in the New World, with things like slavery becoming ingrained as part of the American identity, as well as the democratization, as we call it, of the Christian life, the breakdown of the old established ways of being a confessional church from Europe as it moves into the New World, as there is this melting pot not only of ethnicities and languages, but also the melting pot of different denominational trends and given the Wesleyan and Whitfieldian understanding of revival, really shapes the context of what would become American evangelicalism. The Wesleys and Whitfield, I always say, were really the first British invasion. Not so much like the Beatles, but here in this case, more like the invasion of a new British, robust understanding of the Christian life and of the need for revival and revivalistic preaching. Though we are used to discussing non-denominational movements, and the charismatic movements and all these things from the 20th century, you really have to understand that the Methodist movement shaped so much of the early days of both colonial America and the post-revolutionary era of what it meant to be doing church here in North America. So to begin with, we're going to look in this lecture at who John Wesley was, what was his rise to become a preacher and a revivalist and an organizer of the Methodist church. And then in our next lecture, we're going to look at more of John Wesley's theology, and we're going to contrast that with the theology of George Whitfield. But for now, we look at the man, John Wesley. Wesley was born in 1703, just as the 18th century was dawning, in the city of Epworth, 
It was the 15th of 19 children to Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Now, no, it's not the case that they had 19 little ones running around. Unfortunately, the tragic circumstances of so much of child rearing during this day meant that only nine lived beyond infancy. Still, though, 19 children, nine of whom live, is a pretty staggeringly high number. This is part of the ethos of this day. This is a day before birth control, but also this is a day when so many infants died that it was not uncommon to have a significantly large number of children, at least by the standards of the modern world. Samuel and Susanna are a real powerful combination as parents for young John and Charles. Samuel himself was a pastor there in the city of Epworth, and he was a well-educated man. He had studied at Oxford. Susanna, though, gets the lion's share of the attention. I always say Susanna is one of the great three mothers of the church, known not so much for what she herself writes or says or does, but for the way that she nurtures her children. The three mothers, by the way, in my estimation, are Constantine's mom, Helena, Augustine's mom, Monica, who almost literally chases down Augustine for the faith, and here with Susanna. Susanna was the daughter of a dissenting pastor. Now, by this point, we've carried ourselves through a lot of that material. We've noticed how from Charles I on down to Charles II after the Restoration, you have arise this group, this more or less Anabaptist-inspired, or at least the impulses within Anabaptism are renewed here. This group called the Dissenting Group, a wide variety of all different kinds of stripes theologically and culturally, who took issue with the established church. So right then and there, you can see that Susanna is not someone to be trifled with, let's just say, in terms of her faith. She takes it seriously. Both Samuel and Susanna raised their children in a very, very strict household. All kinds of rules and regulations, things that were, again, somewhat common in this day and age. But Susanna's application of these rules were pretty significant. Some find them to be a bit harsh, but this is a different century, and in this day and age, it was not considered to be too harsh. The children were well-educated. It was assumed that... The thing that struck me about that was if you've got nine kids, you have almost no cho choice but to be strict or what's going to happen. Absolute chaos, right? So... Uh... I think part of it was her background and her upbringing, as was mentioned here, but I think part of it was also the need to be strict was almost just out of self-defense and control. That they would be tutored by their parents in both Greek and Latin. Susanna kept charge of their spiritual life. As often as once a day, she would sit down for a little bit of time with each of her children to assess how they had been that day and to discuss the things of God. Not a whole lot is known about John's early years. There is one more or less apocryphal story. It's a true story, but the implication of it is certainly apocryphal. And that is, in 1709, at the age of five, some embers fell upon the roof, and the entire house went up in flames. All of the family and the kids, except for John, made it out of the house. But by the time they noticed that little John Wesley was there on the second floor in a window, the staircase to reach him was itself up in flames, and the house was really in danger of burning down on top of him. Some neighbors, one man sitting on the shoulders of another, managed to grab him out of the second-story window, saving his life. And John really does see this, and he actually creates some of the mythology here, as part and parcel to the serious call God had upon him. He describes himself as the, quote, brand plucked from the fire. And as the later years wore on and as his ministry grew, he always looked back to moments like this, but this one in particular, as examples of God's unfolding of his plan that he would lead a reformation and a revival for the church, not only in England, but in the New World. John went on to Christ Church Oxford in 1720, one of the preeminent colleges there in the city of Oxford. He was a really precocious student. He graduated with his BA and his MA, and eventually he becomes a lecturer there and a fellow teaching Greek and the New Testament. One of the real turning points for him personally was it was during this time that he began to read all kinds of things on the Christian life and on the application of God's law to himself 
for the sake of holiness. Now, it's important to note here, dissenting churches and Baptist churches and a number of churches and theological traditions now in the English context are not going to have this Lutheran allergy to discussion of the law of holiness and the Christian life. Wesley is often credited with inspiring and starting holiness movements, as they would eventually be called. Wesley himself, as we'll see in our next lecture, talked about something called Christian perfection. And even in the context of what he calls his conversion, there is this belief that the Christian life is not really begun until you have conquered sin. Now, he is at times a bit ambiguous here. Does he mean pure perfection or does he mean something like Christian victory over gross sin where we see sanctification worked out? The complexity of the problem that was so ironclad for Luther between justification on the one hand and sanctification on the other. As we said in our lecture on Luther, he put these two as far as east is from west. As John is studying in Oxford, though, he's reading a number of texts and subjects on the Christian life, and he really begins to nuance his understanding of how God's law ought to be applied to his life. After some time in Oxford, though, he is called to be a pastor in a neighboring village with his father. So he goes back to the area of Epworth, and he is a pastor for two years. Only at the end of that is he called back to Oxford at the urging and prompting of one of his connections there to return to join up and take a junior fellowship so that he would not lose his lectureship at Oxford. So at this point, just important note to make, he's a pastor inside of what tradition or what church? Is everybody clear on that? Anglican. He's an Anglican. He's Anglican clergy. He's an Anglican ordained minister, and he's also teaching there at the theological seminary at, at Oxford. So he is, he is, while his mother grew up in the dissenter tradition, and it, but his father is an Anglican priest, and he's an Anglican priest as well. It's during the second stint in Oxford, again, as a junior fellow, that the origins of the Methodist movement really get underway. Charles Wesley had moved to Oxford by this point. He was a younger brother, and he had taken up his studies. While he was there, though, Charles and a couple of others began to, you might say, have a small group together or an accountability group together. They met in the morning, and they would pray and do all kinds of things together, almost always focusing on the Christian life and sanctification. When he arrives there again himself, John really takes the reins of this, and this movement, what would eventually be called the Holy Club, takes on a new serious tone. On most days, they met from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. to pray, read the Psalms. Actually, there's a note at the bottom of uh, Dr. Reeves' uh, video here. 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. They didn't go 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. That would be, that would be longer. <laughs> and do a number of different spiritual devotional practices. It's almost, you might say, like they're living a monastic life. Wednesday and Friday, they fast. There are honest vows taken that they will ideally not marry and will commit themselves radically to the gospel. They also began to do social work. This is one of the more underappreciated things about Wesley. They started going to prisons and doing prison ministry. They really reached out to the least in their midst. Over time, though, they began just a quick note on this uh, from some of the other research around this. When you think prisons there, what do you think? You probably think prisons like today, hardened criminals and, you know, which there certainly would have been an element of that. A lot of the folks that would have been in prison at that time would have been in a version of debtor's prison. They were imprisoned uh, not because of criminal acts, but because of debt. And so they're ministering not just to, quote unquote, criminals, but they're ministering to those that have been imprisoned because of financial circumstances, uh, which were common of the day, how you might you know, pay off a debt or how you might not be able to pay off a debt. Were these people who were in prison, like doing, like today, it's like you would clean the roads on the side of the like for your community service or something. So were they just sitting in a building it, it, paying it, off their time instead of 
actually working? That's what I understood from everything that I read there and a couple of the other lectures I watched other things was it's not like, you know, the irony of it was you, you owe a debt, you can't pay it. So we're going to put you in a place where you can't earn money. So you can't pay it sort of a sort of an odd thing there, but just the recognition that well, they certainly, everything I read indicated they went to what you might think of as being normal prisons. Think of a broader scope of what that meant when they're doing this prison ministry. And to attract, you might say, the wrong kind of attention. It's not that people were necessarily opposed to sanctification in the context of Oxford. Rather, you might say that people were relatively unconvinced that this was even good at all. This is, again, the 18th century. This is when you're starting to see a malaise and a lack of conviction about being really serious about your Christian life. However, for those who are Christian, overtly Christian there in Oxford, they start to use words that should be very familiar to us if we know our 16th and 17th century history. They begin to be called things like the enthusiasts, which is a code word. An enthusiast is exactly the word that Luther used to describe those who were reformed. Now, in the context of Luther's day, he's referring to the sacraments. By this point, though, in the 18th century, an enthusiast was more of one of these dissenting radicals. And so the Holy Club and the Wesley brothers and a couple of others are being mocked and scorned for not towing the line of traditional religion. They're too serious about their faith. They gained some attention as well because one in their midst died prematurely and quite suddenly. And people began to blame the fact that he had fasted and done all these more excessive things, at least according to the standards of Oxford in this day, and that that might have hastened his death. Now, there is no evidence of this. Wesley himself points out that the man had stopped fasting for a year and a half before his death. There's no way that that had caused anything. But it's that attention, though, from the death of one of their members, where the name Methodist comes from. There was a pamphlet that described these, quote, Oxford Methodists. And in a letter around this time, Wesley actually refers to the name Methodist, you might say, as a badge of honor. They were being called the Methodists in something of a play on words, that these were men who thought that they could, through a certain method, through a certain devotional practice, affect their own sanctification. Okay, I think we talked about this last week, but probably definitely worthy of a stop here and a longer discussion. He's used the word sanctification, what, five or six times at least here. So what is sanctification? Lifelong process of becoming more like Christ. That's a good definition. We're going to steal that one. How is that distinct from justification? Justification is a point in time. So, for example, when Luther, which makes the point over and over again, justified by what? Justified by faith. faith. He's talking about salvation in the sense of, you know, we, again, we talked about this. I know we talked about this last week, you know, the, the Sunday school answer being, justification just as if I had never sinned. Sanctification is that process of working out through discipleship and through, uh, through, it's the working out part of our salvation. If you will, justification is that moment. Sanctification is the process. So you can easily see how when they get labeled as Methodists, which sort of is a derogatory term that they adopt, a little bit like the, the, the term Christians first being applied to those in uh, in Antioch, is that you see how the method part ties to the idea of sanctification, this whole idea you're working out that out, you got a method for doing it, there's a plan, there's a checklist, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so that's what Methodism really becomes about, is this focus on sanctification. We're going to circle back around after we do some of this background stuff and really focus in on justification and sanctification and the scriptural elements of that, because that's the theological application. But I want you to hear that difference between justification and sanctification. And Dr. Reeves in, in this, this lecture video and the next lecture video is going to be co constantly contrasting Wesley's approach to that and how it, how it differs from Luther. <clears throat> not to say that Wesley and both Wesley's and Whitfield and others that were part of the Methodist movement had disavowed salvation through faith. It's just that they were now 
working out the working out part, the sanctification part. And Luther was very worried about focusing too much on sanctification for fear that it would actually suggest that salvation came through works. And so that's why he, I think he used the word almost a Lutheran allergy to it. You know, anytime you went in that direction, that was sort of, um, that set off alarm bells for Luther because he was worried about people looking at that and sliding back into the very thing that he was trying to um, argue against was that salvation had something to do with works. See how that, can you, can you understand how those two things would get in tension with each other? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically the whole thing of, you know, the book of James, when you think about it there, when you talk about, you know, the balance between faith and works and what that means. Yeah. <clears throat> Wesley takes it as a badge of honor. He's saying, fine, call us the Methodists. We are people who care about the method of sanctification and about the progress in the process of the Christian life. As this spiritual experience deepens, Wesley ends up taking up a missionary activity to the new world. Again, he seems to be driven by his faith to want to go and do good works in a more, we might say, radical way. What was happening about the same time? Just real quick, Georgia is relevant here to tie back to what I just talked about before. If you know a little bit about the history of the English colonization of Georgia, which came as a result of taking some land from the Spanish that came out of uh, various things that were there, is that Georgia was populated by a lot of what? Anybody know? Yeah, it was, it was one of the first examples of, um, you know, Australia fits this description as well uh, for, the, uh, for the British Empire, of folks coming who had, who had been imprisoned in England who were then used as settlers. Many of the ones that came had been in debtors' prison. So they were coming over now as part of them being able to pay off that debt. So you can see the connection between Wesley coming to do this missionary work in Georgia, of all places, in the American colonies, because of the connection of what they had been doing in the ministry there. Time is there's a very important member of parliament by the name of Oglethorpe. And Oglethorpe, like Wesley, was really committed to the least of those in their midst. Oglethorpe's passion was for the cessation of what was known in this day as debtor's prison. Those who got into debt, depending on how much, could be thrown into prison. And until the debts were paid back, you often would stay in that prison. Now, obviously, you can see the problem right here. If you are in prison, how in the world are you going to pay back your debts? In a manner of speaking, it was essentially a death knell to someone's life or their career. Well, Oglethorpe really lobbies hard against this excessive penalization of falling into debt. A number of debtors' prisons are shut down. However, the problem is, is you're spilling all of these prisoners out onto the streets, now with no money, still in debt, technically speaking, and often they were unhirable. Well, Oglethorpe actually puts a proposal before Parliament in which some southern lands in the New World will be established as a new colony to rehabilitate those who had fallen into debt and who needed just simply, from an economic standpoint, a new way of life. And so in 1732, the state of Georgia is founded through the action of Oglethorpe in order to provide a place for people to come and start over. Well, the city of Savannah, as it would eventually be called, was one of the first places where they landed. Wesley decides that he is going to join up with this group. He is going to go and minister to those who are moving to the new world to start over. And he hoped he was going to do missionary work amongst Native Americans. Now, again, it needs to be noted, not everyone who moves to Georgia during this time is themselves a debtor in the worst possible sense. Rather, this is a haven for them. Others came for economic reasons, etc. But the central purpose of it was to be a place, again, to start over. And it speaks to Wesley's passion here. He wants to go to where those who have, in part, just come out of prison or maybe those who are starting over, all kinds of reasons that people are moving to this new area of Georgia. But Wesley decides that he is going to move there, and he is going to become the pastor of this new fledgling community. Unfortunately, it all went downhill pretty fast. There are a number of stories that really provide us evidence that Wesley's world, you might say, is beginning to unravel just a bit. On the boat ride over, actually, 
and we've noted this in a few places, a trip across the sea in this day and age was really pretty chaotic and hectic. Until the discovery of instrumentation to be able to measure longitude, it would not be too extreme to say that you're essentially sailing blind. You know where you are in terms of latitude based on the horizon and on the sun and other kinds of things. But you have no idea how far you've made it across the Atlantic Ocean, how much more time is left, and it could be, frankly, pretty nerve-wracking. We noted in our lecture on the 18th century that a trip over the Atlantic could take anywhere from 21, 22 days at its best to a whopping three months to get all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And just to put that in perspective, I uh, don't want to change this too far, but what you would do, latitude being how far north-south you are, right? Longitude being how far you are east-west. And so the typical way of sailing is you knew the latitude of where you were trying to get to. For example, you're in Houston, we're at approximately 30 degrees north. We're 29 and a fraction, depending on where you are. So if Houston had been on the coast of the, of the eastern seaboard, you would have known that to get to Houston, you needed to be at approximately 29, 30 degrees latitude. So what you would normally do is sail until you were on that latitude. And then you would basically try to stay on that latitude heading straight west. That makes sense? But you wouldn't know how far you were on that line necessarily east-west because they hadn't managed yet to do the process by which they would measure longitude. Later, that would actually be done by clocks and comparing it to local noon. That's how you would figure it out. But the reason these voyages could take varying points of time is depending on what time of the year it was and predominant um, wind uh, patterns and current patterns, there are times when the wind may have been very favorable to go down and get on that line of latitude and just go. Other times you were heading too far south or too far north to pick up the winds. And so you would just go at whatever pace it was. So again, literally it could be a matter of three weeks or three months because the only thing you could do is get to the right line of latitude, do your best to stay on that, hope that you didn't encounter uh, bad types of weather at various types of year and just sail across. So again, it was, uh, you didn't know how long it was going to take necessarily to get across, or you would come across using the winds and then you would have to navigate along the coastline to get to the appropriate north or south of the latitude that you were at. Very imprecise depending on currents, depending on the winds. The ships during this time were also not necessarily massive. Well, what happens during the trip is Wesley loses, frankly, some of his nerve. His patience and his trust in God is tested. On the boat with him were a number of people who we will talk about in a minute, known as the Moravians. Their leader at this time was a man by the name of August Spangenberg. Spangenberg is coming to the New World in part to find a place for the Moravians to have new land and new opportunities in the new colonies. He actually heads straight for Pennsylvania at some point, where he founds the first Moravian church in America. He also is the man who founds the city of Nazareth in Pennsylvania. Spangenberg, in other words, is vitally important and a very key figure in this Moravian movement. Well, the Moravians, again, coming out of Lutheran pietism, are significantly passionate and confident, you might say, about their salvation and about their place should God decide to take them home. At one point, there was a storm that erupted, and Wesley, losing his lunch, quaking and shaking and fearful there on the boat, was struck by how peaceful and calm the Moravians were during this ordeal. They were singing the Psalms together, quite patient, realizing that should their life be forfeit, that they rest in Christ. <laughs> Meanwhile, Wesley, again, is just simply shaking like a leaf. That's a real crack in the armor. Here's a man who, frankly, had probably a good bit of pride. He knew he was about his serious faith. And yet here, when it was actually tested, when he thought his life was up, he was bested by those from the Moravian Church. The second major crisis that Wesley comes across while there in the city of Savannah is his relationship with Sophie Hopke. Wesley arrives to the area of Savannah, and he's mentoring, essentially, you might say, as a high churchman. He's big on liturgy. He's big on the Book of Common Prayer. At this point, of course, he is an Anglican pastor, an Anglican priest. He follows the Book of Common Prayer, and he does all kinds of different things 
very much, you might say, from the high churchman perspective. Well, as you can imagine, in the colonial period, there were all kinds of folks there in the New World who were not necessarily positive on the state church or the traditional way that things were being run. He seems, in other words, to have chafed relationally with a few people. His relationship with Sophie Hopke, though, is a real microcosm of where Wesley's personality is going. He is attracted to her. He even seems to have a certain amount of love for her. He wants to marry her at some point, but eventually he comes to the conclusion that they are not meant for each other. And then Sophie Hopke, almost with a little bit too much haste, marries someone else there in the community. The issue, though, is that Wesley is also their pastor. And so, in a real foolish move, applying the strict letter of the law from the Anglican service and the liturgy, Wesley, as the pastor, sensing, notice, sensing, that Sophie's concern for the matters of the faith had grown a bit dim now that she was happily married, meant that he should withhold communion from her. Not just from her, though, but also from her new beau. <laughs> this is retaliatory, obviously. The next service, he withholds communion from her and from her new husband, and it sets off a chain of events that eventually gets Wesley kicked out of Savannah. He has to flee, and he runs with his tail between his legs back to London. So, much so in summary, how was uh, Wesley's experience in the uh, quote-unquote new world? Um, not so great. A little rocky, huh? Uh, the trip over, uh, you know, I couldn't help but think, especially seeing the image there that, that Dr. Reeves pulled up, you know, I, I thought back to the example of the uh, disciples in the boat with Jesus and, you know, their response to the storm, his response to the storm, all of our responses to the storm were sort of similar to that, you know, in terms of application. But then, uh, you know, the situation, once he gets over and he's in position here, you know, just human failings, the human things that go on. And so he came with these grand plans of, you know, evangelizing Native Americans and doing all this good work and all of this, and uh, ends up not being successful in that and having to go back. So uh, any thoughts or questions about that? Anything pop in your head when you sort of hear that part of the story related? Anglican priests were allowed to marry. Yes. So was there something specific that made him assume that they did Um, I don't I, I don't remember reading anywhere anything that was super specific about it, but uh, what was Kathy's question? Just uh, the whole the whole thing since he kind of had this affection, love for her, it, you know, enough to feel. <laughs> like jealous, I guess, would be the reason that he decided he should hold communion from her and her new, house, new husband. Yeah, new husband. But if he was allowed to marry, why? What happened that made him, you know, decide that he shouldn't marry her? And I, I don't know. It just seems weird to me that he kind of. I, I agree that, you know, yes, it, that was kind of his own human feelings, but I wonder if there was something specific that she did or that happened between them that would make him decide that they weren't meant to be together. I mean, obviously, I think he must have still had feelings for her to do what he did and then to kind of have to run, you know, back home to England. Um, because of it. I don't know. I certainly had never heard that story before. And again, yeah, there may be, I never heard that one either. There, there may be more detail that's out there and I just didn't come across it, you know, not having read like a full biography of, uh, of his life. I know that there are several longer YouTube movies, just like there's stuff about Luther, there's stuff about Wesley, obviously. So one of those may go into that in more detail. But again, the big picture is it's one thing to be part of the Holy Club in Oxford. It's another thing to get out in the real world in various ways and actually, you know, have things put to the test, which I think is, and we'll see as, as his life unfolds and as the, the, the movement unfolds, the impact of even this on him.
but so for the missionary going off to do so much good. It's around this time where a real depressed, morose, kind of beat down Wesley remembers the Moravians who had been on the ship with him heading over to Savannah. And he's back in London, and he actually attends on one evening, the 24th of May, 1738, a Moravian meeting there in the city of London at a place called Aldersgate. Now, you'll recall from a lecture on Lutheran pietism that there is this movement towards, not works, but towards the emotional life, towards the passionate, true Christianity, as people like Spencer and others began to talk about in Germany a century before. Well, there at Aldersgate, there was read aloud the preface to Luther's Romans commentary. Again, Luther, the great man about the gospel. And Wesley describes this actually as his conversion, and he says, quote, my heart was strangely warmed. It is some halfway point between a pietistic emotional response and something that Wesley would go on to describe later as a conversion to, he thinks, the actual Christian faith. Now, there's been all kinds of head scratching about this and fights and debates. The biggest problem of all is how do you understand a man who has been about the Christian life his entire life, who has been a pastor for years, who has been a missionary to the new world, and who has sought the things of God and rested on salvation, seemingly at least, all these years, how can you describe this in 1738 as his conversion? Well, the answer is in part that Wesley himself describes it as a conversion. The central problem, though, is when Wesley describes what that conversion is, it's very clear he's not talking about justification or a sinner's prayer. He says in a letter that what he has converted to and what he believes conversion is, is finally the eradication and the conquering of sin in your life. He says sin had warred within him, and because of this conversion, as he calls it in 1738, sin no longer dominated him. Now again, from a Lutheran perspective, from an early Protestant perspective, that sounds suspect. That sounds, you might say, Pelagian-leaning, something like this. But where is Wesley coming from? He's coming from this dissenting, Anabaptist, relatively holiness-focused, sanctification-focused perspective. And even though he's been an Anglican all these years, there is certainly almost a DNA within him that is seeking not so much the conversion through the sinner's prayer or through resting alone on the works of Christ, but rather this yearning for conquering sin in his life. Well, in 1738, he has found this. Now, the question is, is how does pietism link up with this dissenting movement there in the English context? Well, in part, the answer is that connection happens, you might say, personally in John Wesley's life. What do I mean? Well, I'm often asked to describe what evangelicalism is, because evangelicalism in the modern context and in the historical context is Protestant, but it also has different impulses, and it doesn't at times, you might say, feel quite the same. Well, without being too pejorative or too overly simplistic, when asked what evangelicalism is historically, I often say it's the Protestant understanding of justification, in particular that of Luther with the Zwinglian understanding of the sacraments, virtually no evangelical in the context of the Americas, particularly not after Wesley, tends to believe in a pure physical eating of the Eucharist. So they trend Zwinglian. And that combination syncs up with the pietistic movement of the emotional life, of regeneration, small groups, and revivalism. How do all those things come together? Well, in this case, in the person of John Wesley, they come together in his life. Here is a so do you follow that? Can you go back and do it again? The, the, not the whole thing, but that. Yeah. or too overly simplistic. When asked what evangelicalism is historically, I often say it's the Protestant understanding of justification, in particular that of Luther, with the Zwinglian understanding of the sacraments, virtually no evangelical in the context of the Americas, particularly not after Wesley, tends to believe in a pure physical eating of the Eucharist. So they trend Zwinglian. And that combination syncs up with the pietistic movement of the emotional life, of regeneration, small groups, and revivalism. So if you will, it's Luther's take and what he brings on 
justification by faith alone. It's the Zwingli concept. Remember, they're going back and forth about what actually happens with transubstantiation, consubstantiation, what's really going on in the Lord's Supper, with the understanding being that it is not the actual body and blood of Christ. And then what Wesley has now encountered because of this Aldersgate thing and his, the Moravians and the, the movement of pietism, which is not broadly there, but has been there for a couple of hundred years, arguably going back all the way even before the Reformation back to Hus, is bringing those things all come together. And where they come together uniquely, as Dr. Reeves is pointing out, is where they come together uniquely in the life of Wesley. Uh, which is why, especially because of the things that will follow from this, that's so influential. This is bringing these elements that were related, they're all part of Protestantism, but were separate, it's bringing them all together. The, Wesley becomes the linchpin at which these things connect for the first time in a major way and in a way that's going to be carried forward. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Hey, Don, from, from last week, um so the pietism it was it was it was a moving away from doctrine and more about feelings is that right right that was that heart head thing about the emotionalism you know we think of it as being the piety being the works part of things which it is but it's more tied back to more what's going on with the heart condition than the the confessions and the doctrine which is the head condition okay and you can see how the encounter with the Moravians on the boat ride over, you know, that, that tied, that allowed him to connect back. In fact, you know, the argument can be made if Wesley doesn't fail in some ways in Georgia, we probably never get this version of Methodism. Not because that things weren't going on back at Oxford with the Holy Club, it was still happening while he was gone, but Wesley's personal experience in what happened with the thing over, you know, the, why he ends up failing sort of as a pastor in Georgia and has to go back. Wesley's personal experience greatly feeds into what becomes, what eventually becomes Methodism, as we're going to see it influenced out here. And again, he described what happened at Aldersgate as a, as Dr. Reese pointed out, as a conversion. conversion. Well, he's already a, He's already a believer, so he's definitely not talking about justification. So what is he talking about? Well, it relates somehow to this idea of sanctification. Hey, I want to interject. If any of you ever get a chance to take a trip to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, it was, I'd never either heard or remembered about the Moravians, but still very prominent um, Got to attend a Christmas service in the original Moravian church there. It's very interesting um, history, and it, it was it was very very um, just delightful to be there and learn about them. Cool. And remember, it said that Ansberg, um, um, I think I can't remember his name now off the top of my head. He founded the city of Nat. Nazareth, Bethlehem, sort of see a trend in what they were doing with naming those yeah. cities. Yeah. Um, and again, the, Moro the Morovians are connect back and they go back even again pre like pre-Reformation back essentially to growing out of uh, um, John Hus, which is about a century before Luther. Um, How do all those things come together? Well, in this case, in the person of John Wesley, they come together in his life. Here is a man who was raised by a mother of a dissenting pastor. He had himself been Anglican. And now he has described his conversion with these pietists from the Moravian church. Not only that, but in that same year, Wesley takes a pilgrimage to Herrenhut, where Count von Zinzendorf had founded the Moravian church from the very beginning. Wesley, you might say, will combine a number of different theological and ecclesiological elements within his own self-identity. He will not simply become Moravian. Again, he's going to go on to establish the Methodist denomination. But he will incorporate all kinds of ideas about how German Lutheran pietism should be shaped in the context of holiness. Now, as we'll see, 
particularly when we look at our next lecture, the shift, the change in the person of Wesley is that Wesley is not Lutheran. He has very little concern, frankly, for Luther's concern about the differentiation between justification and sanctification. If anything, Wesley is ultra committed to the subject of sanctification in a way that would make him fundamentally opposed to the Lutheran faith, that you do not seek sanctification because to do so would be to justify or at least appear to be justifying yourself by works. Now, as we'll see in our next lecture, that's unfair to describe Wesley as being non-Lutheran. However, with the coming of John Wesley and with his conversion here and with his rise eventually to be head of a new Methodist church, you see a new day dawning where the Arminian perspective, as it was known a century before from the Synod of Dort and from the Dutch regions, gets reshaped and remolded to become the Wesleyan holiness and Arminian perspective on the Christian life. Questions, comments about that? I'm not going to start the next video because we don't have time to finish it, so I don't want to get us caught in the middle of it. So this is a good time to unpack some of the uh, some of the other stuff and and, and catch up on uh, and catch up on questions. So Donna, I I think I remember y'all kind of grew up in the Methodist Church, right? Yes. <laughs> how how much did I mean I don't know, but how much like did the Methodist yeah. Church and what the conversion gonna do? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, like again, I haven't heard anything about it. I don't know. Say that again, Kathy. Like, like did, did growing up in the Methodist church, was there like any kind of a point where you learned more about John Wesley or? Um, um, I don't remember ever learning anything about John Wesley. Um, I also, I will say that, you know, as, as pretty much with any church, whoever's in the pulpit, um, there's differences. So right. David, David went to a Methodist church, you know, when I met him and I went to a Methodist church, but our Methodist churches were vastly different. Hmm. I, I had never truly heard the gospel in a real way of understanding the need for salvation at my church but I very much did at David's church. Huh. Um, the way that I would classify the church I grew up, it seemed more like a social club. Um, the preaching, they had an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, then you close the book and they just talked about something that wasn't really, to me, true preaching. Um, David's church was different. Um, Did, um, I know that there was the Methodist church there basically just right across the street from Cimarron. And I know yeah, that's, where, yeah, that's I the know one where, we went to. Well, I know where David's mom lived. So did they, they, they go to that church? David, David's mom didn't go to the Methodist church. She went to Uvalde Baptist. But at some point, I think through one of David's older brothers, I don't know, somehow he got connected with Old River Terrace Methodist Church in Channel. Hmm. So that's where he went. Uh, probably junior high, high school, I guess. And so his, so his pastor was Pastor House? Because um, Kayla oh. was... The pastor I, there, when my friend Kayla, her father was the pastor there. That could also. be. I, I'll have to ask him, Sherry. I don't. That sounds familiar, but but I'm not positive. So, but it's very possible. Okay, Sherry. Since you had a friend <clears throat> whose dad may have been, it was was the pastor at the Methodist Church in Channel View. 
Yes, I went to school with her. I, I mean, I remember all through uh, middle school and her senior year in high school, you know, the Methodist church, they move the pastors around. They don't, the right. church doesn't call them, they're moved. Right. And Ms. Uh, Pastor House was moved to a church in Galena Park. So Kayla ended up graduating from Galena Park High School. Mm. So that's how I became friends with a lot of people in Galena Park was because Kayla became friends with people in Galena Park. And so I became friends with a lot of people in band at Galena Park High School because of Kayla. Do you remember going to um, church with her, like in hearing? No, that's why I was asking. No, we were, I never went to church with her, but, um, you know. Well, I, I, knew her, I, knew, I knew her dad, I knew her mom, so. Well, I knew lots of friends, so I'm a little bit, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised, surprised, but I'm a little bit, Donna, because I knew other people, families who also attended the church there where y'all attended. I guess I'm a little bit surprised to hear, I mean, it, you know, it makes me sad that um, the church didn't and I agree, I agree. I don't think it was a church thing, but I think that, you know, the fact that the church didn't really, you don't remember them like preaching salvation. I mean, right. it being that social kind of a thing. And I, I think there is something very social about the church, but yeah. Oh, sure. If you're, if you're not, <laughs> If you're not getting the message of salvation. Well, and I mean, you know, I also have to say that that could be partly a, a perception I had at the time. Right. No, I, um, I but I do remember at some point my mom had some um, Methodist handbooks that had been given in honor of us kids by mm -hmm. them and they were given back to them at some point and I remember later in life you know after I had actually gotten saved um just thumbing through that handbook and and I was like shocked that I actually saw you know, the plan of salvation and all of that in that handbook, because in my, in my mind, I was like, I never heard about that, you yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, I certainly, you know, <laughs> if you're going to church, at what point, you know, does it really not just become about the social aspect of it versus. Yeah. But I mean, certainly you didn't, it, it wasn't like people that I remember you know, had Bibles, had their Bibles open as a message was being preached or anything like that. But David did have Al as his youth minister, so you had that thrown in there too. Yeah, the, well, actually, it was probably through the youth ministry and a youth choir that they had at Old River Terrace that I became a part of. We went around to different cities and sang, and that's really where I more learned about the gospel and, you know, sin and the need for a savior was through that, through that youth choir. And I think it was because of the leaders that, you know, were involved. I think their last name was Ball. I can't remember their first names. Was that Craig's mom and dad? Uh, maybe that sound Craig sounds familiar. Cool. Can everybody see what I have up on the screen right now? <laughs> yes. The order, order of salvation. Just wanted to show this. We're going to be coming back and unpacking this a little bit after we do the thing next week. But this idea of you know the process of salvation here. So here's the justification, which is something that God alone does. The thing that's in the um, in the parentheses is who's the actor in this. Sanctification being something that is a God plus a man thing. Just like conversion from an Arminian perspective, 
to some degree, maybe elements of some, if you're not a full five point Calvinist, being a God man thing as well. So this is, you know, this is the where we are in the process here, the justification, sanctification, glorification is our ultimate life in the future uh, with God. So we're going to come back and spend some time unpacking the justification, sanctification thing after we get some of the background on Whitfield, which is parallel to what we just did on West. Questions, comments? You said that he had a lot of kids. Will we get to the fact that he actually does marry and start having kids? Yeah, I don't remember all the... I thought that would be... I don't remember all the details on that because that wasn't something different. Because he already looks old. Yeah, the one that we you know, the, the one I know they're showing the same pictures and stuff like that, but I'm like, when's he getting yeah. married and going to start having all of these kids? Well, the other thing that you know is pretty clear in all those various pictures, he got a very prominent nose feature, the little bump or hump on the nose is the one consistent thing you see across all of those pictures. And again, next week when we when we do the video, the video next week. Next week Fourth of July. So are we meeting? Well, that, that's something we probably need to talk about here. But when we when we pick back up in the next class, the um, the connection will be talking about Whitfield, who's parallel and overlaps with Wesley in lots of interesting ways. But also that's where we'll get into the next thing, which is Wesley's take on Arminianism. Because we, we talked about, you know, the Calvinist Arminius situation. Most what people think of today as being Arminianism flows out of Wesley's further exposition of that, not going back to the classical uh, Dutch version of Arminianism. All right. Well, Kathy, I just read, I might have been thinking of his parents as the one yeah. that had I just I, read that he I'm married. Sure he had. I know his I know his brother had a lot of kids, but I, I'm trying I don't remember exactly. Uh, it says what, it says he married at 48. He married a widow with four children right. and they never had any children together. Yeah, I, I think Charles so maybe I, it was just his parents. I had I, I'm trying to remember to go back. I think Charles had the larger family, had the larger family, but I don't remember that specifically. I know that he had kids, but I couldn't remember how many or the circumstance there, but that, that makes sense when I know about the biography that it was later. What was the average age of getting married in those years? Oh, certainly into the, you know, teens would not have been uncommon at all. You know, pretty much once, uh, once a female had gone through puberty in most instances, you know, she was of marrying age. She was ready to have kids. And of course, it talked there a little bit about infant mortality rate, you know, infant mortality rate and well, maternal. I was gonna say mortality so many, rates. So many women died in childbirth. Also in childbirth or shortly thereafter. So If there's nothing else, I'm going to stop the recording. And...